If you hear that, it's not your hearing going bad. <laughs> that could get annoying, couldn't it? That's the organ, which seems to have a mind of its own. It's kind of working like artificial intelligence that tells you to glue, glue your cheese to your pizza. It's that kind of thing. Sometimes with organs, when they get old and are in need of tender, loving care, notes just play by themselves. So the solution is one of two things. You climb up there, as Andy is doing as we speak, and you find that pipe, and you just pull it out of its rack, and it stops playing. And then if you're a good organist, you remember that that note is not there, and you play around those things. <laughs> or you turn off the organ. So we've opted for the first one. Andy's going to go up and pull that pipe. You'll notice in a second. But pay attention to the sermon, not to that. <laughs> um, but I will tell you, this is, this is all part of why we're doing this organ project. Um, we know, don't we, that in our life of faith, worshiping together on Sunday, particularly worshiping in song, is part of what forms us and shapes us and sustains us. It's important and valuable. And so our beloved, but a little bit, is it, is it fair to say decrepit? Is that too mean about our organ? Maybe that's pushing a little bit? It's not. It's pretty close. Our beloved organ is in need of some work, and that's why we're doing that. So God willing, we'll have an organ that um, really does align with the way we worship and gather in 2025, 20, 26, 27 when it comes in, rather than what we thought we needed a hundred and uh, some years ago. How old is this organ? Is it a hundred years, something like that? Ish? Yeah. So here's what I actually want to talk about, although I'm grateful for Andy and George who navigate all this all the time and the folks who are, who are working on the project to renew this organ and build something that will work for us. It's an incredible gift. So when we read a scripture passage like this gospel reading today, I often ask myself, where do we think we, find, we, we land in that story? Because very often growing up, what I heard was people imagining themselves standing beside Jesus, pointing at those terrible Pharisees and saying how bad they were. Right? Um, we knew better, and we weren't like them. But here's the thing about stories like this. So Jesus is with his disciples. God forbid they eat some grain on the Sabbath. You're not supposed to pluck grain. That counts as work. You don't work on the Sabbath. Better to starve to death, I guess, than have grain to eat. And so Jesus points out to them, uh, with no small amount of consternation, that they're getting it backward, these folks that are accusing him of doing something unlawful. And he says, people aren't made for the Sabbath. We're not made to worship the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a means by which we can worship God. It just gets better, doesn't it? Is he, he's okay up there, though. Oh, there he is. We can't even find him. We're just going to keep going with the note. It's a beautiful note. We'll become very attached to it. Thank you for trying, Andy. <laughs> um, he just turned it off. So, you know, we'll pray now. Thank you. <laughs> who, knew who knew turning off the organ would be a heroic act for an organist, right? <laughs> we'll hope that when he turns it back on, that stops. We'll see. It won't. Oh, yeah, so it's not actually a pipe. It's actually the reservoir of air that has a leak, and it's about to sort of blow. So when we turn it back on, we'll see what happens. So he says... The Sabbath is only valuable, it's only useful. The law, in other words, for, for Jewish people who frame their life of faith around law in a way you and I don't understand, so let it be what it is, but it's only useful if it's building up our faith, drawing us closer to God, enabling us to serve God faithfully. Right? Right. So, here's the thing. In a story like this, we need, hard though it might be, to identify with those Pharisees. We're the ones who take something we're attached to, put it in the place of God, and say that everything else is in service of that. So the challenge then is to say, okay, look, I don't, it's not plucking grain on the Sabbath. That's not my thing. But something is my thing. I get, um, I get attached to old practices, traditions, habits, and decide that those are more important than actually simply following God, where God is leading, 
now. This is what we do. And it's a particularly acute issue for the church in 2024. It just is. Uh, So we need in this gospel reading then to sit as if we're one of those Pharisees getting angry at Jesus because he's not doing things the way we think he should. Because he's not doing what we've always done. Because he's not honoring these traditions. Because he just doesn't understand how important these are. And so we'll get him. This is important for the church, the larger church, and this cathedral parish. By the way, we just had our annual meeting today, a little bit ago, where we take a step back and look at how we're doing and all this, and we're doing well. This is a thriving, life-giving, Christ-centered, faithful community, uh, living into a call to welcome everyone. I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. And at the same time, we, like every church, not just every Episcopal church, every church is having to rethink just about everything in 2024. Now, this has been happening for a number of years, but it's getting more and more acute. We are not living in the world the Episcopal church was built for. We're just not. Now, that doesn't mean we have to um, completely reinvent, but we have to We have to own that and live into where God is calling us in the future. I want to suggest, therefore, for us as a community of faith, for all of us as individuals, three spiritual practices. Ken and Haley, it won't surprise you, they alliterate, because I love that. So you can start thinking about it. They all begin with an L. L is the word today. Just like our call is to be loving, liberating, and life-giving community, those aren't the three L's, but they work well for this. That's what we're called to be, right? We're called to be beloved community, to live more and more every day into the crazy, broad ramifications of what it means that God loves everyone. That's our call. Anything that's not serving that, anything that is not enabling us to become beloved community might be nice, might be good, but it's not serving that purpose, and, it, and that's what we're called to do, to follow God in this way, a beloved community. The first practice then, and it is a tough one, friends. For me, I'll own it, but for us, and we run into it all the time, the first one is letting go. We actually have to be ready to let go even of the parts of our faith practice that are most dear to us. We might not be asked to let them go, but we have to be ready to let them go. Everything. And if you think, oh, come on, James, not everything, go back and read what Jesus says to his followers. Because I will tell you, everywhere it says, you got to let it all go, even your own life. So let me put it another way that I really like. We follow Jesus. Uh, We live into this life of faith together not necessarily at all cost, but at all risk. Do you see the difference? We might not be asked to give everything, everything up, but we need to be willing to give up what God asks us to give up. We risk everything, even the parts that we think are good and that we very much like. We've stopped singing some hymns, for example, because we know that the words to those hymns do not reflect anymore what we understand now of our call to become beloved community. Hymns that, frankly, I love. They still, ha- they still, they still get sung in my heart sometimes, and I realize that's, they're good, and I'm attached to them in a nostalgic way, but they're not reflective of what it means to become beloved community anymore. So we let them go. Not at all cost, but at all risk. So what are the pieces for you that you're not ready to risk? So that's the first one. The second one is learning. This, I hope this was the obvious one when I said they all begin with L. Did anyone think learning when I said they all begin with L? No? Thank you, Julie. Merci, Julie. C'est bien. And she speaks French. She doesn't, you know, it's apprendre in French. But she's, thank you, still thought of it. But learning, here's the thing, it's, I'm becoming a grumpy old man, um, and, and when, you, when you get to this stage of life, you really do start thinking you know everything you need to know, and we don't. As followers of Jesus, we never know 
everything we need to know. There's always something more to discover about our life of faith. We can read a passage of Scripture dozens and dozens of times and still get insight into what God is calling us to do from reading that. We can sing a hymn several times a year for years and years and years, and suddenly there are words in it that are going to just stir us up to something. We can hear another sermon about a similar theme, and it's going to tweak us, peek us, poke us in a new way, if we let it. If we let it. So the second question is, what is it that uh, you and I need to learn today, this week, this month, this year, as a cathedral community, but as individuals, wherever we live? The third practice, then, is leaning into that love of God. Man, this was so important. Because here's the thing. We don't have to get it all right. We don't have to have it all figured out. Because the foundation of our life is that God loves us. God accepts us. God is always in the process of transforming us, even when we're holding on tight to something we don't need to, even when we think we know it all. Even in those moments, we can lean into that love of God that will transform us every day. You know this, right? You know that the foundation of what we say and what we do every Sunday is the powerful truth that God created you and me out of love, with the capacity to love. And that presence of God in us changes everything. Changes everything. when we live in that place, when we lean into that most basic truth, we actually have a greater capacity to let go of things we're attached to. We actually have a greater capacity to be open to new insights and new learnings. And I think this cathedral, this wonderful community that gets that foundation so beautifully right, this place as a community has a capacity to live into that becoming beloved community like no place I've ever lived. It's amazing. I get emotional about it, don't I, Kim? Every time I say it. (laughs) An incredible capacity to do that. And alongside that, that's true, and alongside that, this church faces the same choice every community of faith faces right now, which is how how hard are we going to hold on to the past and say, this is how we do things here, this is how we've always done it, this is how I like it, sticking with what I know, and then finding reasons to justify that? And how much are we going to lean into that love and grace of God to become, to become beloved community going forward now and in the future? So I invite us to make these practices of ours individually as a community here, and for those of you who aren't in this community all the time, take it back to wherever it is that you normally do worship. And see if there aren't ways that we can practice uh, and embrace and live into the grace of God to let go. Be ready to let go of everything, even the things we're most attached to. To be ready to learn something new every day and every time we gather. And underneath, supporting all of it, to lean into the transforming truth of God's perfect love.